Good morning. Good morning. I'm Freeman Rabowski from UMBC. When I take people to the roof on my campus out in Baltimore County, I point to downtown Baltimore, and people are always impressed. And what I say is that the strength of the region is directly tied to the strength of Baltimore City, that the cultural issues, the major challenges that we face can all go back to the strength of Baltimore City. And the economic strength is what's most important. And so when we are attracting people to this region from all over the world, whether to start companies or to go to school, it is because of Baltimore City that things are much better and we can continue to bring the brain power to this area. What's exciting to me is that the mayor has already announced that she is determined to address the financial challenges of the city and to be bold in doing that. And what that means is she's looking not only at what happens today, but what will happen in the future. And so addressing the structural challenges will be critical. What that also means, though, is she has a vision for what the city should be. Already, we have seen major progress in several areas. Number one, violent crime has been reduced to historic lows. Number two, and most important for all of us, public education is improving substantially. In fact, we have seen large gains in the test scores, growing enrollment and graduation rates, and a 50% reduction in dropouts. And so, as we see new investments in downtown and in neighborhoods, more and more people will want to be in Baltimore City. We should all be applauding the mayor for being a bold leader, unafraid to make the tough decisions now so that we can all be better off in the future, and with a vision of bringing more families here. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to introduce to you our mayor, Stephanie Rawlings Blake. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. First, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And thank you, President Rabowski. I know that uh, you have to leave shortly. It's not every day that you get introduced by one of Time Magazine's most influential people in the world. So I'm very grateful. And I'm uh, also uh, very proud of the amazing work uh, that you do in the Baltimore region. And thank you for supporting uh, Baltimore. You understand more than most uh, that uh, the, the uh, future of the region and the state depend largely on the future of our, of our city. And thank you for being so supportive. Uh, you're a great example of the wealth of talent that we possess here in Baltimore. So being the mayor of a great American city is the most rewarding job. Rahm Emanuel, the mayor of Chicago, calls it the most intimate form of government, and after half se a half century of public service, William Donald Schaefer said it was the greatest job he ever had. And I know from time to time, Governor O'Malley wishes he was still here instead of in Annapolis. Working together with our community's local government is the place where we get things done. And for mayors of dynamic and ever-changing urban centers, it's an awesome responsibility, and it's an opportunity to help to help individuals, to help neighborhoods, to help businesses, and to help the city as a whole every day, even on my toughest day. I feel very blessed to have this opportunity. This is an important moment in Baltimore's future. Today, I'm very pleased to present Change to Grow, a 10-year financial plan for Baltimore. Change to Grow is the first of its kind long-term fiscal plan to help achieve our goal of growing Baltimore by 10,000 families over the next decade. It's born from a belief that our work to get Baltimore growing again must be first grounded in stable city finances. With such a plan in place, Baltimore can finally end the chronic cycle of deficits that have eroded services and constantly put the city on the defense instead of investing in its renewal. Make no mistake, Baltimore faces serious fiscal challenges. That's why this plan includes a bold set of major reforms to fundamentally change the way the city does business in, these, in three critical ways. By eliminating the serious structural deficit and protecting basic city services from devastating cuts. By making modern investments in neighborhoods and civic infrastructure while reducing vacant blight 
and by further reducing the property tax burden on city homeowners. With that, let me begin the presentation. For over 50 years, Baltimore's story has been dominated by a narrative of post-industrial decline. From 1950 to 2000, while sur surrounding counties have grown, the city lost a third of its population. Jobs disappeared, crime rates rose, schools deteriorated, and many neighborhoods destabilized. Families and investment fled, leaving 16,000 vacant homes behind. And city government itself was left with a legacy of high taxes, growing liabilities, and crumbling infrastructure. But over these last several years, population loss is slowing to a near halt, and many neighborhoods are experiencing new growth. Today, Baltimore is safer. Public education is improving with growing enrollment, and vacants are being rehabbed, and our businesses are making new investments. Our port is thriving. Education, health, and research institutions are creating new jobs, and our tourism sector remains strong. A new urban story of growth and reinvestment is beginning to emerge. Baltimore is at a, a turning point, and we must ask ourselves this question. Will we allow our hard-fought victories to become just a momentary pause, a footnote in a continuing story of decline? Or will Baltimore cement a true turnaround towards a future of sustained growth and prosperity? Our local choices and our local actions will help drive the city's future. We have the power to make the difference. If we do nothing to address our structural financial problems, Baltimore could revert back to a dangerous cycle of disinvestment, further population loss, job losses, and a weakened tax base. But if we take bold action now, we can get Baltimore growing again with new investment and stronger communities that attract and retain people and jobs. We all know that the status quo is unsustainable and we know our path is clear. We must change to grow. Many cities only engage in long-term financial planning as a reaction to receivership, to state takeovers, or bond rating downgrades. In Baltimore, it's a proactive effort so that we never reach that point and so we can choose our destiny for ourselves rather than having it chosen for us by others. We cannot grow the city of Baltimore on a foundation of a fiscal swamp. We need a strong foundation in order for city government to be effective, an effective driver of growth. That means a balanced long-term budget and the investor confidence that comes with it and quality city services with lower, more competitive taxes. <coughs> the 10-year financial plan is a product of more than a year of careful study assisted by national financial experts outreach and meetings with dozens of key stakeholders and collaboration between city agencies. This is a financial plan that's about being realistic about the resources that we have. Without major changes in the way the city does business, our city will face serious structural deficits between slow growing revenues and faster growing expenses. This cumulative shortfall totals nearly $750 million over nine years. To put that, money, that number into perspective, it's more than we spend on police, fire, health, and recreation and parks annually. We must fix the structural deficit. But we also need to make smart investments that reward our future. The 10-year financial plan is based on four, the four cornerstones of a strong fiscal foundation. Balanced budgets, more competitive tax rates, investments in community infrastructure, and reducing long-term liabilities. Let's talk about the import, why it's important to balance the budget over the long run. Core city services are important, and citizens rely on these services for their quality of life. Police and fire protection, trash pickup and street cleanings, recreation and parks, and funding for education. If we don't get ahead of the problem now and balance the long-term budget, we will only have bad choices to fix annual budget gaps. 
furloughs or freezing pay for city workers that deliver these important services, including resorting to layoffs. And finally, more tax increases and less value for the taxes people pay for services. These are all bad choices, and all of them hurt our ability to grow. But there is another choice, and we have to think ahead. We can change now and take bold action to make government more innovative, more effective, and smaller. We need to invest in technology and automation, streamline workflow, and break down the silos of bureaucracy to improve productivity. We need to modernize our vehicle fleet to reduce maintenance costs while improving the equipment we're using to deliver city services. We can improve purchasing and contract management to constantly evaluate the way government delivers services to improve efficiency. And I'm setting a new goal of, of streamlining the size of government itself by reducing the workforce by at least 10% over the next eight years. By making innovative changes, we can do this without major layoffs or uh, cuts in, in core services. The biggest drivers of these proje projected deficits are pension and health care costs for employees, current employees and retirees. Over the last several years, while revenues only grew by 3%, health care costs grew by 38%, and pension costs nearly doubled. Even with significant reforms this administration has put in place, these costs are expected to grow by another 40% over the next 10 years. And here's the simple pr truth. There's a major imbalance in how we compensate our employees. The cost of outdated benefits have not only busted the city's budget and caused severe service cuts, they've also crippled our ability to pay our employees what they truly deserve, deserve in their paychecks today. It has to change. We need to rebalance the way we compensate our hardworking employees by reforming unsustainable benefits and instead inv invest in better wages up front. I'm proposing some major changes to make it happen. For all new civilian hires, we should, we should move to a more sustainable 401k style retirement plan. The private sector has shifted to this model and city government should too. And the city will make matching cash contributions to, into individual retirement plans for workers. For existing civilian workers, we need the employer as well as the individual to begin to contribute to their pension, just like in the private sector. Baltimore civilian pension is the only large system in Maryland that doesn't require any employee contribution. That must change. We've already implemented pension changes for current public safety employees, saving more than $80 million annual. Um, and I'm not proposing any more changes for current public safety workers. But for new public safety workers, so new public safety hires, we should move to a hybrid defined benefit, defined contribution plan. And we can rebuild our health benefits to get lower costs from our vendors as well. Right now, we are auditing all health benefits to eliminate inappropriate costs. And we need to improve the wellness of our workforce to reduce costs by promoting fitness and smoking cessation. We performed an evaluation of our, the, the health of our workforce, and the news was not good. Our workforce is unhealthy, and it's driving up our costs. Nearly 50% of city employees and retirees have critical or chronic illnesses or are at risk which is double the rate of the overall care, force, po care first population. I just want to say that again. Nearly 50% of city employees and retirees have critical or chronic illness. We cannot reap the benefit of our reforms or the audit that we're performing if we do nothing to improve the health of our employees. There is no doubt that Baltimore's firefighters are among the best in America. But, because, but the current 42-hour shift schedule is outdated. Among the 25 largest U.S. cities, including Baltimore, 19 fire departments have work schedules exceeding ours with a median work week of 52 hours. We need to work with our fire unions to negotiate a new schedule with significantly higher pay to reduce inefficiencies and prevent further firehouse closures and layoffs. And here's the bottom line for our hardworking employees. We do not propose any of these changes to penalize anyone. 
We're making these changes so that the savings from these initiatives can be used to increase uh, workers' salaries up front and balance the long-term budget, which will prevent future layoffs and pay freezes. If we do this right, city workers can get better take-home pay with competitive benefits. So let's talk about making taxes more competitive. Everyone knows that Baltimore has the highest property taxes in the state. But what many don't know is that we also have the highest tax effort, and that's because of a poor tax base. The yellow bar is the state average. The blue bar is Baltimore City, and let me explain what tax effort means. For every penny on the city property tax rate, the city generates a, about $3.5 million in revenue. For every penny that Baltimore County, uh, on Baltimore County's tax rate, the county generates $8 million, more than twice as much. So in order for the city to generate the same amount of tax revenue, we must tax at twice the rate. The wealthier our tax base is, the less necessary it becomes to tax to get revenue for basic services, including fire, police, and sanitation. And the way to address this challenge is to increase the wealth of our tax base by promoting population growth and new investment in the city. The problem is the only way to do that is to reduce the tax burden, particularly for homeowners. So can you see how this might be difficult uh, when the tax effort is so high? It is difficult. We all know it's very hard to do, but we're going to make it happen, and we're going to do it responsibly. And here's how. First, we're dedicating revenue from the city's newly approved casino to uh, property tax relief. Second, we're making spending reductions uh, and uh, making the government more efficient to generate more tax savings over time. Third, we're moving forward with a state-mandated stormwater charge to rebuild our crumbling storm drains, and we're going to use some of that savings to cut property taxes further. Finally, we should create a new solid waste enterprise for trash, recycling, and sanitation by collecting a user fee, as is done in other Maryland jurisdictions, including Anne Arundel, Howard, Montgomery, and Prince George's counties. If these counties didn't have a fee, their property taxes would likely be higher. A new solid waste enterprise relieves budget press pressures on the general fund, which is supported by property taxes. We will use all of the savings from solid waste innovation, the solid waste initiative, to cut property taxes dollar for dollar. This is not just another, another fee. Combined with other initiatives, it's a net net tax reduction for most city homeowners. And to support this effort, we also need to diversify our revenues uh, that are coming into the city and rely less on property tax revenue. We need to maintain the parking tax rate and to look at a taxi tax so that non-resident commuters and visitors that use our transportation system pay their fair share as well. This will help us keep services like the Charm City Circulator funded. We should allow corporate sponsorship and naming rights for some of our city buildings for new revenue and revisit Councilman Henry's billboard tax proposal. And when the voluntary pilot agreement with some of our tax-exempt institution expires in 2016, we need to renew this discussion with the broader not-for-profit community, which accounts for more than $4 billion in tax-exempt property. Finally, local government needs to do a better job collecting what's owed by auditing city and state tax credits. Already, our Billing Integrity Program, a model for the state, has identified more than $4 million in property taxes previously lost to erroneous tax credits and exemptions. We need to expand this effort. If we do all of this, we can cut the, the effective property rate for the city homeowner by nearly 50 cents, a 22% reduction over the life of the plan. And at a critical time, when families are making the choice to live in Baltimore, or to stay in Baltimore, our property taxes will be more competitive and more families will choose to stay. That means more people, more jobs, and a wealthier tax base. Now let's move on to infrastructure. Our city faces a $1.1 a, a $1 billion infrastructure deficit over the next decade. 
roads, bridges, and city buildings, including our police and fire stations, need significant investment just to meet reasonable standards. According to a 2008 survey, 43% of roads are rated in a poor state of repair. In the past three years, we have done more road repair than any recent administration, yet this still falls short of what we need to do annually to make significant repairs on our roads. 21 city bridges are ripe for replacement. We have to do more to fund these important investments for Baltimore's future. This plan focuses on what we can do locally to invest in infrastructure, including repairing our roads and bridges. But we also need to seek a renewed state commitment for highway revenue, which has declined dramatically in recent years. The General Assembly needs to come up with a viable transportation funding package and pass it to support our state's economy, uh, the city, and the state as a whole. So this plan makes major investments to support the school system's financing proposal to rebuild and renovate our school buildings, including continuing the city's capital contribution for schools at approximately $17 million annually, the local bottle tax that will generate $10 million annually for school construction starting in July. 10% of the city's slots revenue will be dedicated as well. And thanks to our successful effort in support of question seven last election, that number is slated to increase. And as a result of earlier efforts, we are leveraging additional state funds from the city's contribution to teacher retiree health care benefits. Altogether, these steps more than double the city's current contribution to school, uh, city school renovations and fully support Dr. Alonzo's renovation plan, which deserves state approval. So many of you have seen the progress that we've made uh, under our Vacants to Value initiative over the past two years. The program has become a national model. Since launching this initiative, 250 vacants have been torn down. Nearly 1,000 more are being rehabbed, and sales of vacant city-owned properties have increased by 500%. More than 140 new homeowners have received a $10,000 homeownership grant through our Vacants to Value initiative. And even though we've demolished more vacant property than any recent administration, Funding constraints for demolition make it difficult to meet the scale of the problem of vacant, um, blighted vacant homes in our city. So the gray bar rec uh, represents the status quo. And we all know that that's not enough to make a dent in the real problem. And here's what we're going to do to change that. First, we are going to front load $9 million of the new demolition funding from the Maryland Attorney General's mortgage settlement. Second, will quadruple local dollars for vacants to value demolitions to more than $100 million over 10 years. And finally, we'll add a one-time $10 million surge in funding next year so that we can begin to see an immediate impact in all of our neighborhoods. Altogether, the 10-year financial plan will help tear down more than 4,000 vacant structures. We're increasing local funding for infrastructure as well. $1 billion over the next decade. This includes repairing roads, repairing bridges, city facilities, and additional funding to rebuild 10 city recreation centers. The $370 million in total new investment re represents a 78% increase, excuse me, a 68% increase in total infrastructure spending. And we'll continue to seek uh, state partnerships for transportation to build on this local investment. Repairs to our stormwater and sanitation system will help us to meet environmental standards and we'll in explore public-private partnerships to redevelop our arena, convention center, all without taking funding away from our neighborhood capital needs. These new infrastructure investments will not only reward the future, but also provide local stimulus to support job creation. The Mayor's Office of Employment Development will focus on le linking all of these new initiatives to job opportunities and job training initiatives with our city residents. So the final pillar of growing a, a strong fiscal foundation is paying down our long-term liabilities. Our city has unfunded retiree benefit liabilities of more than $3 billion. And we're paying more today because of in the past uh, the city pushed retiree pension health care costs into the future. For example, 
the past failure to pre-fund retiree health benefits now costs us $55 million a year. That number continues to grow. Over the past three years, even with the economic downturn and budget deficits, we've kept working to pay down these liabilities. And our strong credit rating shows that the bond rating agencies appreciate that. Moving forward, we must make an increased, increased payments to pay down future benefit liabilities. And this will ensure that benefits are available for future retirees and it will reduce budget, deficit, budget pressures excuse me, to prevent future service cuts and future tax hikes. Generations of employees who will depend and count on these benefits will have them when they retire. We'll also continue to contribute to our city's rainy day fund to guard against future financial uncertainty. We have a duty and a responsibility to protect our city's fiscal position. Make no mistake, Baltimore's financial challenges are very serious and could have severe negative impact on the city in years to come. The status quo is unsustainable and the price of inaction is clear. More budget deficits will only mean more service cuts and more tax increases. City services that improve the quality of life will decline. Our already crumbling infrastructure will get worse. We won't be able to invest in, in major neighborhood revitalization, and we will see a downward pressure on our credit rating. The old way of doing city business must end. Our future, the city's future, will depend on our ability to evolve under these conditions. And as a community, we must reject the, st the status quo and embrace a call for bold action. We must change to grow. And if we do, we can eliminate the $750 million structural bu budget deficit, protecting our city services from further cuts. We can create new job opportunities and improve our credit rating. We can advance new investment in infrastructure, repairing roads and city facilities, and rebuild 10 recreation centers. We can demolish more than 4,000 vacant homes and spur new investment in our neighborhoods. We can do all of these things while reducing homeowner property taxes by more than 20%. All of this will help to achieve the goal of growing Baltimore by 10,000 families. The 10-year financial plan requires tough trade-offs. It requires major changes in past practices, but it also makes investments that reward the future. Other struggling cities nationally are starting to come back again. Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Richmond, they're seeing new population growth and new investment. And that's what I want for Baltimore. And I'll accept nothing less. Our city's linger lingering narrative of post-industrial decline will not be the story of our future. This financial reform effort sends a strong message to residents to, that Baltimore will be a better place to live in the future. It will show markets and businesses that Baltimore will be a better place to invest and tell state and federal governments that we're serious and deserve their support. Our charge is to grow Baltimore, to rebuild a thriving city where more families choose to live, a place where businesses and institutions make new investments, a place where children find educational opportunity, a place where neighbors live in safety without abandoned blight. And together, we believe a new urban story of growth can emerge out of our collective choices. Baltimore's best days are ahead of us. The city is on the cusp of, of a proud renewal, but the time to take action is now. We can change to grow. And thank you very much for coming out today. This is just the beginning. In the coming weeks and months, I'll bring my plan to community groups and neighborhoods throughout the city, and now, we're going to pass out the hard copies of the plan and we'll have time for a few questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Good morning, everyone. Again, we must change to grow. Mayor Rawlings Blake has laid a firm foundation for a vision for Baltimore that is financially sound into the next 10 years. 
We believe that change cannot happen without people like you. So first, give yourselves a round of applause this morning. Please, come on, like it. We are at an exciting moment in time for Baltimore, and we have time to field your questions after hearing an exciting presentation from our mayor, Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake. We're gonna ask that you raise your hand, introduce yourself, and pose your question. Most of you I know your faces, some of you were actually featured in uh, the presentation, but I would ask again that you would just raise your hand, introduce yourself, and pose your question. We can begin. Don't be bashful, don't can be I shy. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Hey, Absolutely. Baltimore, Baltimore is a college town. We like saying we got 100,000 people in this region who are in the of a college town would you talk a minute about, as I talk to my students who come from all over, who are looking at Baltimore as a possibility, why somebody might want to come and work and live in a city? I know young people really like downtown Baltimore. They enjoy the neighborhoods. Talk a minute about us as a college town, would you? Baltimore is such an exciting place uh, for students. And I know this because of all the stuff I don't know. And when I say that, um, once, you, once you're over 40, you only, you only scratch the surface of what's cool uh, in your town, and uh, we have, so I've heard, a very, <laughs> a very thriving art and uh, music underground scene, uh, very active. It, we've been recognized in Rolling Stone magazine. Um, you know, not that I was looking, but I heard that we're even one of the top places to live for singles. Um, and uh, we're a foodie town, we're a town of neighborhoods. People go all over the country, and you know, we, we still rank in the top uh, 30 uh, largest cities in, in the, the country. And what they talk about cities in Baltimore, you talk, talk about a city like Baltimore, I mean, D.C. Yes, it's cosmopolitan. Things are happening. Uh, but when people come to Baltimore, we're cosmopolitan. We have art. We have culture. We have great restaurants. Uh, all of these things. But it's real. We have real neighborhoods. We have real history. And people want to be a part of that. And I talked to a, uh, a young person from Philadelphia who was moving here. He was uh, turned on to Baltimore by a lot of the work that we're doing around volunteerism. And uh, in, uh, the, in the East Baltimore with uh, the work that the volunteers are doing over in, in Oliver. And he said he wanted to live in a place where he felt like one person can make a difference. That's attractive for college students. So the key is for us to maximize on that momentum. We can get kids interested. It's what we're doing to keep them uh, in Baltimore. And believe it or not, the, 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 the most unusual things that you would think, for example, our urban agriculture initiative, it's making young people want to stay in Baltimore. They are figuratively and literally putting down roots in Baltimore uh, because of the work that we're doing, expanding urban agriculture and creating links in communities. That's when people want to stay. So doing more of those things, as well as creating opportunities that link up to the fields of study that the uh, young people are, are engaged in will help us keep these uh, young people and turn them into Baltimoreans for life. What about opportunities in technology? Young kids want to know about what's possible in technology in Baltimore. I think that we have a lot of untapped potential when it comes to uh, technology. When you take a look at the technology companies that are really doing things in Baltimore, in, in, in internationally, we have many of them right here in Baltimore, fifth best place to start a tech company. We have to be, it, we have to increase what we're doing with the tech community, and we're doing that, uh, developing great relationships with the Bal uh, Greater Baltimore Tech Council, working with our, our local companies that are on the world stage making a difference. Um, I, what I, I want, um, you know, we're, we're talking about these fiscal reforms, but we also have to talk about how job creation fits into that. And for me, it's important that when we look at a road project or a casino project or the school construction projects that we make sure that Baltimore residents have opportunities for jobs. But the road project is going to be over. Uh, the casino is not going to hire an unlimited amount of people. So there are caps on all of these things that we're, that, that we're currently talking about. Innovation, the sky's the limit. If we can create more jobs and technology and innovation and, and make sure that the people who live here today 
have the opportunity to have a future uh, in those jobs, the sky is the limit. So my, my hope is that, you know, that, 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 that my administration, in partnership with, uh, with people like you and uh, other universities, are looking for ways that we can uh, really tap into, in a, in a concerted and strategic way, uh, the technology and all of the, I mean, you're creating all of these geniuses and sending them all over the world. We want them to stay right here and create job opportunities uh, for now and uh, in, the, in the future. There's a question up at the top. I don't know how you're going to get them. There was another hand downstairs. I just wanted to, I saw a hand up over here on the right. Oscar, you had a question? Good morning. My name is Oscar Cobb, and uh, I represent a uh, community called Park Heights. As you know, uh, Park Heights has uh, been devastated over the years, and we are now in the process of trying to make a change. Um, but it's always the finances. So my question to you is, uh, are you going to uh, allow some of that slots revenue to uh, infiltrate the Park Heights community so we can move all of our programs and plans together. Park Heights and any other community that has um, been, been impacted negatively by disinvestment and blight will see results, not just, excuse me, of the slots revenue, but also of the, the uh, infusion of money that we are front loading in our demolition efforts. As you've seen, I mean, you've, you've We've been around long enough uh, to know. Um, I, I made a commitment to you that I would make uh, renewed and increased investment in Park Heights, and I would make sure that the, the master plan in that community didn't just sit on the, sh on the shelf. And we've had stumbles, uh, but we've all, on, on all sides, have made good on the commitment to continue to move forward. And we have been making increased investments uh, in Park Heights, and that'll continue. There's, Another. A there's a gentleman all the way up at the top as well. Can you move back? You were in the light. Now you're in the dark. I can't see you. All right. Thank you. So one of the things that I was uh, just mentioning is the first thing is to make sure that, uh, that these students have opportunities. You can love Baltimore all you want, but your parents aren't going to let you stay here if you don't have a job. <laughs> you know, they're not going to continue to fund it. So we have to, that's you know, part of the work that, we're talk, that I talked about with uh, Dr. Rabowski and making sure that we have job opportunities that are linked to the fields these young people are uh, studying, which is why I'm doing, a, we are renewing and, and focusing our efforts on the technology. We have so many math and science whiz, you know, the bio, uh, biotechnology, bioscience, all of that that's here that has great potential. Uh, so focusing on those opportunities. Uh, but it's also about housing. Uh, people have to have affordable uh, housing options, and we're working to in increase the amount of affordable housing that's available in the, in the city, workforce housing, as well as through our Vacancy Value Initiative, creating uh, in incentives. Uh, I talked about the $10,000 home ownership grant. S uh, some people are being, able, are, are being able to couple that with the Wells Fargo um, grant. Uh, that's out there, and you know, people are. And, and if you can combine that with a live near where your work, live near your work incentive, uh, you can get almost forty thousand dollars towards closing costs. You can't do that everywhere, and when you, when parents are looking for a place for their kids to 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 find a home, and they know that you know right off the bat, their young person is get can get almost up almost up to uh, forty thousand dollars toward their uh, investment, that means something. So that's part of, uh, part of it as well. 
Thank you. Best. And thanks for coming back to Baltimore. Good morning, Mayor, and thank you for this presentation. My name is Hathaway Farabee. Um, I want to commend you on addressing the structural deficit. It's something that I know as a citizen I don't think about all the time, how the chunk of money, particularly in the pensions, and um, the way that you're focusing on the salaries now. Uh, what I anticipate is that we'll just have more revenue, and that's, of course, what you're going for and what we need in the city. And the question to you is how can we help as those of us that are in the city running organizations or living here? What can we do to advance um, this financial plan? So as I said, this is just the beginning of the conversation. You know, the plan that I talked about is more than 100 initiatives. There are some that are going to speak to you more than others. Uh, so the more that you do to get information, so it's, it's about being in communication with the administration and also being in, com in communication with your peers. Uh, that this impacts so we can have meaningful conversations so we can move all of these things forward. I know that I've been having talks with, um, with the union. There are some things that are going to require us to work together to do. Everybody has a role to play. Uh, whether, you know, the, all you, the, if, if your only affiliation with the city is that you own a home here or whether you uh, run a major not-for-profit, you have a role to play in moving this forward. But I think it starts in making sure that you, and, and I know you have a copy, take a look at it. What are the things that uh, impact you and your, your peers? And, and what information can we provide so that we can have meaningful di dialogue about moving those initiatives forward? And thank you for being here. Yes, sir. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning. Uh, Christopher Summers of the Maryland Public Policy Institute. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I just want to commend you on this very bold plan, um, and I look forward to really analyzing the details. Uh, also, I know this took enormous political courage, but also to let you know that uh, my research institute stands ready to work with your administration, specifically on the pension reform and property tax relief plans. Uh, these are two core issues that, that our institute has studied for years. Thank you. We have time for one last, I think I had a jump. Yes, I knew I saw it, hand up. Hello, I'm Mike McGuire, thank you for the invitation. Um, so a couple of questions. One, as we're talking about development in Baltimore, uh, we're often talking about bringing in this, this more property tax base. Mm -hmm. So if we're focused on that, how are we maintaining our focus on the existing population and how, how are we maintaining that dialogue? Ask, say that one more time. So. As you're developing a plan to bring in a, a more wealthy tax base, which is necessary, how are we simultaneously maintaining that focus and focusing on the existing population? And Baltimore is a poor city. So I don't want to get confused. When I'm talking about increasing the wealth of our tax base, I'm not talking about getting more rich people to live in, in Baltimore. It's about making sure that um, when we tax our tax base, that means that we have a more diversified revenue. That means that we're able to find ways, and I talked about the, the fact that we have $4 billion that aren't taxed because of not-for-profits and what can we do there. Um, you know, it's about having a stronger base, not just more rich people. I won't turn down more rich people, um, but that's, that's, <laughs> but that's, that's um, not the goal. I mean, we're, so, as we are, the work that we're doing to bring down our property tax rate, that's about, that's a retention strategy. The work that we're doing to improve the quality of our schools and give families more choices for their young people, that's about retention. You know, it, 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 um, it really breaks my heart to this day. You know, we've made all of these improvements in schools. We're making our, our neighborhoods safer. They're much more interesting to live in some of the surrounding jurisdictions, I know for a fact. You know, the fact that you can walk out of your house and go to a restaurant or go, you know, to a, you know, walk to a park and have a community and a neighborhood, not just a, a place to lay your head at night, makes Baltimore an attractive place to live. But it breaks my heart when I talk to a couple that says, you know, well, we just moved out of the city. You know, we have an 18 months old, so we had to move to the county. That, as long as those conversations are happening, we don't, our retention strategy isn't working. So this, what we're talking about in reducing the property tax will, will help because when people are trying to figure out the economics, the individual economics about uh, where they're gonna live, if we are more competitive, we become more attractive to stay. And if we continue to provide the options that people want for their young people, 
I'm a product of the public schools. My parents were a product of the public schools. My daughter's in public school. We have those options out there, but it's also about making sure that we're connecting new families because, you know, you don't go from, you know, PAZOs to parent-teacher appreciation, you know, parent-teacher meeting. You know, you, you just, they don't, you, you have to have the education in between when you're hanging out and single and when you're starting a family to know what's available uh, in uh, Baltimore City for, for families. So you, uh, we have to do a better job making sure people know that there are quality options for, for young families. So you know, this is about, I, I talk about growing our city by 10,000 families, but may, let me be clear, if we're not holding on to the families that we have, uh, it's a sieve, and that's not a growth strategy. It's about retaining the families that we have and making Baltimore more attractive uh, for, for newcomers. The two other questions that I had uh, had to do with participation. Um, so since, since in, this, in this plan we're expecting empl uh, city employees to shoulder a lot of, of the, the changes in city finances, how is that participation happening? And, that, and the participation mm -hmm. is both with the city employees and in general with the plan. As, so, as, as, a, as a longtime citizen activist myself, I know I've grown accustomed to, to going to city events and finding that, that things that are, are being presented are, are, are presented as an accomplished fact. Um, and that participation often seems to be window dressing. So I, as, as a long-term plan for the city, I'd love to see that dynamic disappear. And then So, so I'll just speak to that part. Okay. The, um, with respect to participation, um, I've, I, before I came here, we've had briefings with uh, the organized labor that represents um, our city workers and with, with the eye on um, getting their participation, getting their feedback. Um, there's, there is, I can point to several things I've done during my administration to reach out and to, to solicit feedback from communities. We've brought the budget workshop sessions to the community so people have a better understanding of the, the budget process. We've uh, solicited feedback on, you know, if you were sitting in my chair as mayor, what would you do? And it's not just window dressing. We take the budget uh, team, analyzes and takes those, um, takes the feedback from our citizens. We have a citizen survey to get that as well. You know, this is a plan, and part of being a leader is to have a vision and a plan. But uh, part of being an engaged citizen is to make sure that you stay engaged and participate. And if and if you come to the table thinking that all of this is a foregone conclusion, it makes my job easier. But it doesn't. You know, it, it, it's not, that's not, that impression that you have is not because of uh, anything that we've set up in the process. We set this up as the beginning of the conversation. We're going here, I'm going here, I'm going into communities and neighborhoods to talk about it, and I'm depending on citizens to be, uh, to give, to give uh, feedback and, and help me move these initiatives forward. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Those of you who posed your questions, to participants who joined us this morning, uh, we are now at 11.30 a.m. And to keep promise uh, to what we, in terms of time, uh, I'll now turn it back over to Madam Mayor for any closing remarks. Thank Again, you. I just thank you, Gus, and thank you all that posed the question. Thank you for coming out. Again, as I, I want to keep saying that this is the beginning of the conversation, not the end. And I look forward to seeing you in your respective uh, neighborhood to get more feedback as we move this plan forward. Thank you for your interest, and thank you in advance for the work that you're going to do to make sure that Baltimore changes to grow. Thank you. Thank you.